Oh, hello. You're here for a story, are you? Well, you'll like this one. The Broccoli Eel by Michel Faber. Inside your tummy, said Benny's mummy, lives the broccoli eel. Benny looked up at her, squinting away from the forkful of green vegetable, doing his best not to see the fresh bruises blotching on his mother's face. Oh yes, she smiled, gently pursuing the clenched little mouth with the hated substance. The broccoli eel, he lives inside of you, curled up in your stomach, and all he wants, she opened her unbruised eye wide, is broccoli. What's that eel? He said, careful not to open his mouth too wide in case she forked some of the green stuff through. It's a fish, darling. Like a big, fat, scaly worm. But this fish doesn't live in the sea. It lives in the water that sloshes around your stomach. I'm sure you feel him in there sometimes, don't you? Benny swallowed hard, weak from the effort of trying to deny so many things at once. The broccoli, the bruises on his mother's face, the sick, slithering feeling inside his tummy. His mummy continued. He can go for weeks without eating. He just lies still doing nothing but not sleeping, you understand, just waiting, waiting for broccoli. A gruff male voice from the far corner of the room scoffed loudly. Ha, oh, let him wait, kid. Benny's mother ignored her husband's interjection, exhausted by his orgy of violence he had surrendered to the television now. He was a lump of old clothes and grey flesh illuminated by the flickering of Crime Watch. Benny's mother leaned close to her little boy and whispered, Making the broccoli eel wait wouldn't be very wise. You see, he can only go without broccoli for so long. Then he gets desperate. What's he do when he's desperate? Benny asked queasily. He swims out of the stomach and goes searching, his mother replied, baring her teeth. Then he eats his way out. Benny noticed that several of his mother's teeth were now outlined in scarlet as if someone had drawn around them with a red felt-tip pen. One of his father's punches must have done some damage inside. OK, said Benny. I'll have the broccoli. His mother's scary grimace softened into a smile then, though the outline of blood remained. Good boy, she murmured with great affection, reaching her hand out to him. Suddenly, she stroked his face a little too hard as if she'd been searching for his body in the ruins of a bombed out building and had just found him against the Lord's safe and well. From that day on, whenever there was broccoli for dinner, Benny's mother would always make some reference to the broccoli eel, even when Benny ate the stuff without complaining. This proved the eel was real. Not that Benny needed extra proof, for now that he'd been alerted to its existence, he could feel the creature inside him. It had a peculiar way of disporting itself, as if it had perfected the knack of getting comfortable in a cramped space. In this case, Benny's guts... It'd either curl up tight inside the stomach itself or wriggle out to lie behind it, warming itself on the surface of the hot, gurgling organ, allowing the rhythms of Benny's breathing to massage its scaly skin. On bad days, even this degree of freedom would cramp the eel and it would push its head up into Benny's ribcage, nestling right under his heart. Whenever it did that, Benny could hardly breathe as each inhalation pushed its his fast-beating, over-sensitive organ down onto the eel's reptilian brow. The eel would blink its eyes and the leathery skin of its eyelids would scratch against the raw flesh of Benny's heart, sending him into a paroxysm of agony. What's wrong with you? his mother would ask him. I've got a pain, he'd say, straightening up for her sake. It was vital that he spared her any additional distress, for his pains often came on just after she'd been beaten up by his father. 
That's too much junk food causing that, she said. You're all blocked up inside. It's over now, he lied. I'm all right. A few more vegetables. That's what you need, she grinned. He couldn't tell if she was teasing him again. Certainly, he was doing his utmost to eat all the horrid green stuff she could throw at him. Well, all except spinach. He couldn't help drawing the line there. There's not a spinach in monster inside me, is there? He asked her the last time they'd clashed on the subject. She laughed. No blood in her mouth this time. Just a rip in the neck of her blouse to remind him. Of course not, she reassured him. Just the broccoli eel. Benny's father, needless to say, did not eat broccoli. He ate beans, sometimes carrots, maybe potatoes certainly, but meat principally. Mostly he ate alcohol. Benny's father instinctively disliked all the healthy green stuff Benny disliked, and Bun wasn't shy about saying so. Maybe he relished the opportunity to quarrel with Benny's mother, but maybe he genuinely, as he often loudly claimed, wanted his boy to have the freedom to choose. Life was too short, he said, to waste it arguing over vegetables. By contrast, life was plenty long enough to waste it arguing over money, or the state of the house, or his mother's looks, or looks of other women. These and many more topics regularly led to blows. And the blows were always to the face of Benny's mother. Why don't you run away from my mummy? Benny asked her one night when she was taking refuge in his child's size bed. She giggled, sending a chill through him right down to where the broccoli eel was. I don't have a driving licence, she smirked, ruffling his hair perfunctorily as if to say, you're a child, you don't understand. Whenever she took refuge in his bed, she would recite the owl and the pussycat to him over and over until he fell asleep. He'd long ago given up asking what a runcible spoon was, or quince, or whether the mince was raw or cooked. Shh. Don't ask questions, his mother would say. You'll only spoil it. So he would slip down the long gullet of sleep, the sound of you are, you are, echoing in his ears like an ambulance siren. On the mornings after, Benny would lie in bed watching his mother walk out of his bedroom and approach her own, as if she were hypnotised, lured irresistibly by the sound of her husband snoring. Sometimes the argument between Benny's parents would start afresh. More often, there would be a few weary murmurs and Benny's mother would go off to fry eggs and bacon. Benny didn't get any. There were cornflakes in the kitchen, the ideal food for a growing boy. If he chanced to bump into his father before leaving for school, Benny would blush and his father would look straight through him, as if he didn't exist. At these times, Benny would wonder if his father despised him more than other fathers despised their children. The evidence was inconclusive. On the minus side, his father never took any interest in what Benny was doing at school, or how he filled his time at home. But then, he never expressed approval of anything except the taste of newly opened alcohol. Oh, and occasionally someone on television would say something and Benny's father would mutter, Right! On the plus side, there had been times not so long ago when Benny's father had taken him out to town or at least to the local shop to buy something. And the two of them had gone on fine. On Saturday morning during the last school holiday, or maybe the one before that, that Benny's father had bought him a whole bag of chocolate-covered peanuts to eat all by himself. Don't tell your mum. On another occasion, when Benny had for been forbidden to leave the table until he'd eaten three loathsome Brussels sprouts, his father had suddenly whispered, Watch this! And flicked the three green balls off the plate, plate one by one with his massive thumb and forefinger. They rolled under the sofa. Benny's father grinned and Benny smiled shyly back, hoping nothing else would happen to spoil this happy moment. These were not idle memories. 
recalled for purely sentimental reasons. They were crucial data. To Benny, the question of whether he and his father could coexist in the same space, man and boy, became very clear to answer. Because one day, while Benny was at school, his mother and father went out for a drive and their car crashed into another car. And Benny's father came back home late at night covered in abrasion and sticks of stripping pla sticking plaster without Benny's mother. She had been squashed in the passenger seat, he said. Squashed? The word tasted strange on Benny's tongue. Squashed, the father repeated a throat-clearing sound as if it was the last time he was prepared to regurgitate it. When will she be home? asked Benny. I don't know, said his father, staring down at his hands which were bandaged. She was squashed pretty bad. Can I see her? She's in a special place in the hospital. Only doctors can see her. Experts, like. Benny nodded. He understood that a badly squashed person couldn't be allowed to go home. She would have to be fixed first. The repairs would be performed in conditions of scientific sterility. There would be operations with masks and microscopes and machines that cost millions of pounds. Doctors would disgust his mother's progress in hushed murmurs. His mother's face in particular we need the attention of the most specialist and delicate kind. The whole process would require almost superhuman patience from everyone concerned. So Benny let the hospital get on with their labour of love, restoring the, of restoring his mother, and he settled down to wait with his dad. Benny's father was unexpectedly good after the incident. He didn't quite drink so much. He got the washing machine fixed when it was broken. He brought big plastic bags of groceries home from the supermarket. Lined up on the unwiped kitchen bench, those bags looked just like proper shopping. Even more surprisingly, he accepted the responsibility of making sure Benny got up in the morning to go to school. Each day, Benny would wait to see the apparition of his mother glowing in the doorway and then rub his eyes as she metamorphosed into the big bear of a man. The disappointment was brutal, but it had its consolations. At least Benny had proof that his father cared. To be fair, Benny's father tried as hard to care for his son as any alcoholic man could. To be, he even took Benny to McDonald's several times a week and bought him crisps and Mars bars from the corner shop, booze benders permitting. That was half the problem, really. Benny considered that his diet was suffering, and only his diet, mind. As a person, he had nothing to complain about. It would be shameful to feel sorry for himself, an able-bodied child with unbroken bones and peachy smooth skin, when his mother was no doubt desperate to leave the hospital and come home to him, yet must struggle to walk on splintered legs, humiliated, by her slow progress. She would be a patchwork of flesh, scars all over her, a creature so distorted that only the wisest surgeons could imagine her regaining in the fullness of time her former feminine shape. Would she ever be beautiful again? It was too much to hope for. He hoped his mother was concentrating on putting one foot in front of the other. He hoped she wouldn't say anything to make the doctors angry because she was so dependent on their goodwill. His mother talked too much. He knew that. If only she could hold her tongue and do everything she was told, she would be all right. Meanwhile, Benny had problems of his own. Greasy, fatty, sugary problems. All these chocolate bars and fried fish fingers and beef burgers his father were giving him were all very nice, but a boy needed vegetables. And of course, the broccoli eel needed broccoli. At first, 
Benny's father had boiled broccoli at his son's request, as if it were just another kind of prepackaged treat. Some new kind of chocolate bar purchased it at the supermarket rather than at the greengrocer. The broccoli even looked a bit like junk food, all wrapped up in transparent cling film, never less than perfectly green. Unfortunately, the broccoli eel could tell the difference. It had been raised on the authentic Brassica oleracea, unruly in shape, lacking none of its natural inheritance of vitamins and stuffed with as much calcium, Benny's mother used to always said, as a glass of milk. As time went by, the broccoli eel grew restless, squirming outside Benny's stomach, exploring the crevices of adjacent organs, warming its toothy snout up into Benny's breast, beating its spiny tail into his back passage. It wanted the kind of broccoli Benny's mother always brought home. I'm not going to go miles out of my way just to buy a bloody vegetable, his father said, and that was that. From then on, Benny's life became a little more desperate every day. It was as if the spirit was being sucked inside the dark, meaty tissues of his own body. His thoughts were no longer free to fly around the outside world, but never left his skull bubbling and expiring in the damp cauliflower of his brain. His innards were constantly blocked and upset, causing so much pain that there was no room even for memories of his mother. The broccoli eel squirmed and fidgeted every waking minute, exploring the nooks and crannies of Benny's tender guts as if looking for minuscule remnants of the good green stuff. To appease the creature, Benny tried eating a greater amount of broccoli more often. But this only made a slight difference and had the unlucky side effect of annoying his father. You haven't eaten your pizza. I'm just finishing this, pleaded Benny, choking on a cud of spongy green moss. One night, arguing over broccoli again, Benny and his father found each other staring fiercely into each other's eyes. The father's fist trembling near the boy's cheek. The boy's knuckles smeared with fake mozzarella cheese. You're lucky to get pizza for tea, scowled his father, lowering his fist and sinking back into his armchair. If I wasn't here to take care of you, they'd send you to a children's home. They'd ship you off to Ireland to one of those orphanages. You wouldn't get pizza there, I can tell you. No, what would I get, thought Benny, and the thought leaped from his brain into his bloodstream, travelling downwards to be digested. That night, Benny was woken from his sleep by an excruciating pain in his guts. He knew immediately what it was. The broccoli eel had left his stomach again, and this time it was not content merely to stretch. It had lost patience with being fed the wrong food and decided to scavenge for something better. Greedily, it was gnawing at the flesh of Benny's insides, nibbling at the cabbage surface of Benny's lungs, nuzzling its teeth into the soft flanks of his pulsating heart. In a frenzy of panic, Benny wound himself into a ball under the bedclothes and begged, begged, begged the eel to stop. The eel stopped. Benny was bewildered. He had never imagined that any communication with the eel was possible. But the eel had not only stopped eating Benny's insides, but seemed to be speaking to him. Not aloud, but through Benny's bloodstream. Fishy whisperings, amphibian suggestions floating along in the vessels of Benny's inner world, tropical with fever. In no time at all they had bubbled against his brain, suffused their meaning like a powerful aroma. The eel was telling him what he must do if the two of them were to coexist. Okay, okay said the boy, slithering out from between the sheets. Hours later, 
Benny was sitting at the foot of his father's bed. The dawn was coming. A man in uniform was approaching the front door. And Benny thought that this event must surely have something to do with the future. But the man left again after putting down the milk. The sun came up properly and the traffic began to trickle into the arterial roads near Benny's house. The day was proceeding normally, despite everything. Benny wondered if he should go to school or whether that would make it harder for police inspectors to find him. It was most important that police inspectors found him because they would make sure he passed through the right channels. Benny had no wish to avoid what was coming for him. Wasn't it strange then that the world was taking no interest? Here he was, all ready for upheaval, all ready for punishment, and still no one was running towards the house. No one was beating at the front door. Just sunlight and silence, despite the fact that lying there on the bed was a man with his throat all shredded and messy, like a beetroot salad. Inside Benny, the broccoli eel had curled up to sleep, nestled so neatly amongst his intestines as to be hardly there at all. In a nature book given him by his mother, Benny had read about snakes, about how they could go for months without food if they had to. The broccoli eel, now that Benny had made peace with it, was showing the patience of a snake. It could wait. Benny walked to the front door, opened it, stood on the porch. He was still in his wet pyjamas, still clutching the fork in his fist. He was hoping the world would glance at him in passing and notice that something was amiss. Shivering with cold, he watched the cars drive past his house, counting them under his breath. Occasionally a driver would glance at him through a tinted windscreen for a fraction of an instant. But the peristalsis of traffic didn't permit a lingering look. Benny wondered if it, what it would take to stop someone in their tracks. He was too shy to wave the gory fork around. Benny squinted into the difference, to where all the traffic seemed to be heading. It was a motorway, a complex serpentine intertwining of passages, shimmering with vapour. Presumably there was an exit somewhere beyond the horizon, too far to see where everything straightened out and became simple. But how anyone or anything could find a way through to the other end was a mystery to Benny, and he was gripped by a new fear. Soon... Someone would take him away from here and send him to a children's home, one of those places where there was no pizza or chocolate. Only those foul-tasting foods that grew in dirt and were good for you. That was all right. He was ready. He would eat only healthy things from now on. He would grow tall and resist all infection. He would have a wide shoulders and rock-hard muscles. He would be able to lift a frail, crippled woman in one hand. But how would his mother know where to find him? He pictured her entering a labyrinth of roads and highways, getting swallowed up in its endless coils. She didn't even have a driving licence. What if the children's home was in Ireland, as his father had threatened it would be? Wasn't Ireland across the sea? Benny closed his eyes his puny body trembling in the wind, and tried to imagine his mother crossing the soupy ocean in a year and a day in a beautiful pea-green 